Located on 225 acres in Garden City, Long Island, Nassau Community College, a member of the State University of New York System, has close to 20,000 students attend the school each year. The college mascot is Leo the Lion, and these are his stories of the school's absolute best and brightest who have graduated over the past 50 plus years. So let's catch up together as the Alumni Association of Nassau Community College proudly presents Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. Welcome to Lion Tales. My name is Dr. Linda Nady and I am a director on the board of the Alumni Association at Nassau Community College and a proud graduate. I am here to celebrate the successes of our alum and together we will share stories that will uplift, inspire and often amuse you. Each week, I will introduce you to the alumni of Nassau Community College interested in sharing their experiences while attending the college and the secrets to their success. Look for many new and exciting events on the Alumni Association social media pages and share any exciting news with us on Facebook, Instagram, or on our webpage at ncc.edu slash alumni, or find me on X at Dr. Linda Nadian. The lion is the mascot for Nassau Community College. The lion is associated with balancing power, intention, physical strength, and grace. Our alum possess these same characteristics and symbolize courage, nobility, royalty, strength, stateliness, and valor. Lions are a symbol of royalty, and all of our alum contribute to the beauty of our college society. Lions are typically decisive, confident, and natural leaders who are focused on achieving their goals. The lion's roar is his symbol of strength, of leadership, and of pride. And together we are Lion Tales. Today I would like to welcome to Lion Tales Dr. Timothy Keogh, class of 2005. Dr. Keogh is a proud alum who earned his associates from Nassau Community College, followed by a bachelor's degree in history from Hofstra University, and a PhD from City University of New York Graduate Center. He ran cross-country at Nassau Community College and was a D3 All-American. His hobbies include history and gardening. Nassau Community College inspired Dr. Keogh to study history and piqued his interest in becoming a historian. He feels lucky to have had Nassau Community College as his inspiration to succeed on his journey in life. Welcome to Lion Tales, Dr. Timothy Keogh, class of 20, 2005. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Great. So tell us about your decision at the very beginning uh, to attend Nassau Community College. Well, to be honest, it wasn't necessarily uh, a decision, you know, that I was looking forward to, per se, not because of anything <laughs> Nassau, but I wasn't the best high school student. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I finished high school. and What do you do next? And uh, essentially, you know, my parents are going to college, of course, and they encouraged me to go to Nassau because it was you know, an a, a affordable option to kind of explore, to see kind of what I wanted to do. And so, to be honest, that's where a lot of, I think, the, that was a, the most popular school where I graduated from, in Farmingdale High School. Yeah. Um, to right. go to college. Yes. So, it wasn't surprising. Many of my classmates were going, and it seemed like, okay, I'll go there and, and see how it goes. Um, and that's kind of how it started. It wasn't any kind of epic story or anything like that. It was just... You know, that was the kind of typical option people did when they were 18 on Long Island. <laughs> yeah, and so when you left, um, so you graduated from Farmingdale High School, and then you were coming to this campus. Did you commute? What was it like at, on the campus during that period? Oh, yeah, I commuted, um, and I got a job. I actually worked at the gym, um, and, and so I was there a lot, like 12 hours a day. <laughs> between classes and between um, working in the gym. And I also was on the cross country and track team. So I was there all day, you know, more or less five days a week. Um, it was great. You know, it really felt, even though I know it's a community college, it, it felt like a campus. I went to Hofstra and of course people actually lived on campus there, but it really didn't feel too much different at NASA, at least from my small world I lived in. Cause you knew other employees and coworkers and athletes and things like that. So it was very lively. A lot of things going on on campus activities and clubs. Um, and you know, it was, fun. <laughs> yeah, how did you get involved with the track team here? Well, I, uh, I ran in high school. Um, and, and so uh, part of the reason was, you know, I, I ran high school, I ran competitively, I got some injuries in high school. So I ended up getting any scholarships to go to four year school. So I said, let me give a shot at Nassau Community College. And that's what I ended up running. Um, and with uh, Jim Palace, with the coach, the head coach at Nassau Community College, he was fantastic, unbelievable, uh, the head coach. And it was a lot of fun running um, at Nassau because you know, it was a real eclectic uh, group of people. You know, I'll give you an example. Our, our 4 by 8 team, 4 by 800 relay team, it was me, uh, another young per, uh, man from Levittown, uh, a person in their mid-20s from Baltimore, Maryland, and then a 65-year-old man 
wow. who was from Montana. Yeah, he was from Montana, and he, and he decided to go to college. And this is our team. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, it was amazing. You know, and it was great to be on a team like that and just kind of, you know, and, and the one, the, 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 the man from Baltimore was fantastic. He was unbelievably fast, like the fastest person to four by by far. And me and the Levittowner, you know, we could, we could hold our own. And the 65-year-old gentleman was a little slower, but... You know, he still held his own as well, and so we were still competitive, even though we had this kind of random hodgepodge team. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds so interesting. Now, the first few classes that you were taking on campus, do you remember what they were, and and uh, what was that first day like having having a course in in, in a community college? Well, it's funny you say that because um, you know I took the first semester was typical classes, you know, math, to science, um, you know, a social, uh, history class as well yeah. as I think an English class, like the typical liberal arts stuff. Um, but I wasn't a very good math student in particular, especially in high school. And I remember walking into this math class, which was, I think, pre-calc, and I had not done well in pre-calc in high school at all. No. <laughs> um, I don't even I know what first, pre-calc is. <laughs> you know, to be honest, yeah. it's been what? so many years, I don't know if I could tell you what pre-calc is anymore. <laughs> However, <laughs> I managed to get a, a B plus in, in the pre-calc class at NASA, which is way better than me barely passing in high school. And I just remember walking into that classroom and, you know, the professor had the syllabus and kind of, you know, described the class. And I kept thinking, like, okay, this is different. I don't know. It felt like it was more manageable to me. I don't know whether what it was. Um, but definitely that first semester, I really I thrived in the way I didn't expect um, that I would have given my high school experience um, and how much I kind of got absorbed into these classes and the teachers felt Oh, they just felt good at what they did, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that that's a part of uh, most of the alum that we speak to, they they have... it's it's sort of the same story where they didn't do such a great job in high school and were kind of unsure. And once they came to Nassau, it was sort of a springboard to this newfound success, thinking, wow, I couldn't do math, but now I can. I, I didn't know if I was such a great runner, but now I'm on the track team. And, and also that so many of the alum have earned a doctorate. Which is really amazing because you sort of went from, you know, zero to um, 100 and and now, you know, people are, are working on research and writing books. And it's really interesting how NASA sort of cultivated their souls to move them in that direction. And uh, it's really interesting. Upon graduation from Nassau, what what did you think you would do? What were your immediate goals there? Well, it's funny you, you said that about the springboard from zero to a hundred. Um, it was because of a class I took in the last semester at Nassau that made me want to get oh, well, not necessarily get a PhD. I didn't exactly know that was the path, but to become a historian, like that was that was that class. It was a a class I took with uh, Professor um, Philip Nicholson. He was formerly the chair at Nassau, Nassau Community College's history department. He's since retired. Um, but the class was called Racism in the Modern World. And, um, you know, this class was fascinating. And I, I, to be honest, I only took it because it fit my schedule at the time. And I kind of took every history class available. So I took this one as well. But the class was totally engrossing. It was kind of a, a discussion-oriented class. And, um, you know, uh, Professor Nicholson at one point mentioned that um, Long Island was one of the most segregated, racially segregated places in the country. And I kind of was taken aback, like, what? <laughs> I thought that was the South where that <laughs> kind of thing happened, you know? I was completely taken aback. And, you know, I remember driving home that day from NASA. I took Jerusalem Avenue to go home because traffic is so bad at rush hour. Yes. And uh, I went through Union. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I went to Uniondale and East Meadow, and I just all of a sudden my eyes were open. Like, oh my God, Professor Nicholson's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, each neighborhood, is, uh, especially in 2003, was, or, uh, I'm sorry, was like so, so divided. And uh, it just opened my eyes. And then I kind of just was obsessed with this issue. And I kind of was like, kind of pursued it. I always took classes that kind of related to it directly or related to the theme of racism generally. And uh, here I am 20 years later still still researching and thinking about it. So my point to say is I graduated NASA. You know, I began NASA having no idea what I was going to do, just taking classes. And I finished NASA with a very clear idea, like, I want to be an historian. You know, I want to get there somehow. And then, of course, eventually I kind of learned more specifically how I actually achieved become a historian and then I of course got a PhD eventually and that's kind of the path you take. Yeah, and now, you know, as a professor and a published author and you know standing before students that you're teaching now, uh we spoke a little bit with a few other guests about that motivational piece 
because a lot of them think that they can't do it. And and we as students probably felt that as well. But how do you sort of create that environment to uh, support their endeavors now? Because you have come so far from when you were first a high school student. Yeah, it's funny you say that, yeah, because um, I am a community college teacher now. Not in Nassau, but really close to Nassau in Queensboro. <laughs> community college in Bayside, Queens. And the way I always, always do it is I always tell my students every semester that I was a community college student. I was just like them sitting in that classroom, you know, and I usually tell the story I'm telling right now that I wasn't that motivated, you know, to give them the idea that like some of you, you know, some of them are very incredibly motivated. This is your second career. And as you know, as we know, community college has all sorts of students from all sorts of walks of life. So, but the students who are motivated and there, you know, to get a, a second degree, they don't necessarily need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're there. But there are those students that are more like me, right? And they could be 18 or they could be 30, you know, and, and they really kind of been working jobs but don't have a career. And I always feel like if I can relay that story and identify, you know, and say, look, I was you, <laughs> you know, you know and, 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 and how this, you know, the, the college experience, if you do it right and you kind of listen and you kind of, you know, you take studies seriously, it will transform you. You know, it really absolutely will. And I say, I'm a living example of it, you know, and I, and I always make a joke. I don't want to sound like a PBS special, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but, but it is true. Like, I can't deny it. Like, it, ab- it absolutely did in every, in every way imaginable. You are listening to Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Linda Nadian, and our guest today is Dr. Timothy Keogh, class of t- 2005. So tell us about your bachelor's degree is in history. Uh, What are your thoughts on teaching historical content or when alleged changes are made to history as we know it? Or do we really know it the way that we think that we do? So typically, how lucky, luckily, I'm a, I'm a college professor, and part of the reason I want to become a college professor is I don't have to teach to a standard. You know, the students don't have to pass a regents or <laughs> anything like that. And that means I don't have to um, for not force them, but I don't, I don't have required to teach them certain kind of content. And what I typically do is I offer them perspectives. You know, I, you know, kind of like a taking sides, kind of, you know, there's this perspective on, let's just say, the New Deal, or there's this perspective. And that allows me to integrate maybe a new perspective on a topic, you know, something like the women's liberation movement, without having to necessarily say, well, this is the right answer now, (laughs) you know, and and instead allow students to make kind of a decision and debate it and kind of come to an informed opinion about how they want to interpret that. And the idea there is to ultimately say that, History is not like a settled, hard science, you know, in terms of like gravity or something. Rather, it's interpretations we make of the past to answer questions of the present. And we can take, you know, one fact, a simple fact, the Social Security Act, and we can have many different interpretations of it. Um, And that's kind of what I want them to come away with my class, rather than understanding, you know, what the Social Security Act did, but rather it's the meaning that they see it you know, from from the evidence presented to them. Yeah, we've been using something called a Socratic seminar where it's basically more about, it's a topic, but there are opinions so that people can come together and sort of just discuss the topics openly based on what they already know, as opposed to, you know, anyone putting a lot of ideas in their head at the beginning, which is good, because then you can kind of build upon what the students already know. Do you find that, you know, certain things that have changed, you know, historically the past few years with, you know, removing statues from certain places or, you know, certain statues or certain individuals in history being offensive to others? Um, how do you sort of approach that with even with college age or, or older students? Um, well, one thing has been, I guess, good about the controversy, you know, to put, a, put aside the actual taking down the statues or not, um, is that it is a topic I could easily bring up, you know, in terms of class. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, and the one thing I learned uh, is, you know, the opinions vary so much. <laughs> you know, so it does be very easy to create a very lively debate. And I've never had a class where I kind of can kind of get a sense for like, oh, everyone's on this side or that side. Like it really ha- doesn't seem, even though, gen- even though it's been, it's been, Many couple of years now we've been doing this, yes. the taking down of monuments at this point. And there, there isn't like a generational divide necessarily. It's very, very divided. It seems it seems personal, but it also seems kind of you know, people's own kind of local, you know political you know beliefs in many ways inform what they think should be done with those statues. Um, so it's kind of a point of debate. 
Uh, but it, it's not like we teach it as a good or bad thing or really can because the students come with so many different opinions to it. Yeah. Do you think that I, I believe in having a strong, you know, content knowledge base? Like if there's something that we don't know, you know, we look it up or we read it or, or we try to find out the information because then it can be presented well in context. I think a lot of the you know controversy comes when we do we don't put things in context uh, we just think we know and we really don't um when you're planning the lessons do you ever sort of get in that position where you think they need to know more and how would you direct them to find out that information well that's probably the hardest part because <laughs> i do think they may know more it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to read more <laughs> and not even because they're good or bad students it's just as you know community college students typically are working they may have kids you know so to say hey beyond the you know 30 or 45 minutes to ask you to read, read this other half hour of stuff, you know, it's, you know, they're busy, unfortunately. So oftentimes what I think is like, okay, you know, I have them in this classroom for an hour and 15 minutes, whatever it may be. Yeah, how can I try to introduce something like you're talking about and make the time as useful as possible because I know their time is incredibly limited. Um, so I can unfortunately oftentimes necessarily add to the burden that I already have of the basic content to kind of add additional content given as you're talking about a, a, a new a new research angle or maybe a new controversy that's related to the historical topic. It's 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 tricky. Um, so usually it's something I kind of bring up myself. I try to you know summarize, you know, there was a new article or you know, or the thing of taking the Christopher Columbus statue down in Columbus Circle. What would yeah. that mean, you know? And something like that. Yeah. So tell us about your book. It's called In Levittown Shadow, which is a very interesting title. Yeah, In Levittown Shadow, uh, Poverty in America's Wealthiest Post-War Suburbs. So essentially, it is a history of Long Island, um, but it's a history of Long Island from the perspective of not the suburbanites, the middle-class suburbanites who enjoy the you know, Levitt house, yes. but are the people that are making less money. And, and kind of, it looks through their eyes um, and how they navigate living on Long Island, surviving there, and working there. And then what it kind of means about Long Island's prosperity. And you know, among the things I really cover here is the housing crisis, which we know the affordable housing issue is a front and center on the island now, as it is in the country. Um, but I kind of look at that longer history and how people who didn't have the money to get a mortgage, how they managed to find housing um, and on Long Island after World War II, you know, 1950s and 60s. And then I also look at the difficulties of people who don't make enough money to kind of survive and pay uh, for things and, and, you know, and how that, how they manage and navigated um, Long Island. But it, yeah, it covers familiar topics, of course. Levittown, um, Grumman and Republic, the big defense manufacturers, and also questions of like illegal apartments and, you know, um, racial segregation, segregated schools. And so I'm trying to understand kind of how we've gotten to Long Island today, where there is very little housing available for people who are young or people can't, you know, get a half a million dollar mortgage or yeah. more. And then also how, um, you know, how Long Island remains so segregated. It's less segregated than it was in 1970. Absolutely. But it still is. And so how did that come to be? And, you know, why does segregation also make different, like suburban school districts so unequal? Yes. Um, you know, some are so much richer than others. And how did that happen? So that's kind of what the book, the book focuses on. Yeah, there's a Levittown Museum in the Levittown Memorial High School, which is sort of like a recreation of the way the houses looked, um, I guess, in the early 50s when people started buying here for the first time when the houses became available and they have the room set up the way that the house would look, you know, allegedly how the house would look, which is, you know, also uh, trying to maintain the, uh, I guess, the uh, focus on history, you know, in the in the early 50s when people were buying these Levitt houses. And have you seen that? No, I did not know. And it's funny you say that because um, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's good to know. Because there is no real le original Levitt house left, of course. All these have been, you know, uh, right, changed, yeah. improved upon, fixed up. And, you know, if you drive through Levittown now, it's even hard to see one that even reflects, even looks at, resembles yeah. an original Levitt house. You know, then, and it makes sense. These houses were not... They were not, you know, particularly built in the, in, with any expensive materials. So the only way to, you know, keep them going for 70, 80 years is to, is to, of course, you know, improve them. <laughs> yeah, and all the things we didn't know, like who knew we could, you know, blow the roof off and, you know, blow the back out and, and uh, update the fireplace. I think all of them have the, the, they were all built with that legitimate fireplace in the middle 
you know, separating yes, the dining room and the kitchen? Well, at least the, 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 the main cape models, they were, yes. Yeah. Um, but something I didn't know, in fact, I'm standing alone right now until I started researching the book, was the original 11 houses, the second floor was unfinished. It was just stairs to nothing. Yeah. It was an attic. And that was at a cut costs. And this was typical. It was very popular throughout Long Island, not just Levitt houses. Um, and that kind of gets to the question of like, well, you buy this house and you only have, really has two bedrooms, you know, and really because the second floor has nothing. And so it's either you go up there and you learn how to, you know, <laughs> put flooring right, in yourself yeah. or you go to a kind of a, a you know, home improvement uh, contractors and subcontracts. You hire them. And that got into the sticky issue of, you know, how these, contractors were affordable as they often hired low wage labor as a way to, you know, and we know this, right, with day yeah. labor, construction, everything. And my book kind of gets into that. But it's really interesting because these Levitt houses kind of required people to hire people to finish their homes because yeah. they bought unfinished houses. Um, and then that way. So, you know, and it's, then it's with, kind of interesting. Want, yeah, without um, like sort of a Home Depot type, you know, in the, I wonder, you wonder when they moved in, in the 50s. I mean, I know that a lot of my relatives came from either Brooklyn or Queens and they bought they bought their Levitt house out here. And now my my uncle, particularly on one street, my cousin ended up buying the house and he lives there now, but it doesn't look anything like it looked when they bought it. So it's it's really interesting. Although a lot of work was done, you know, solar panels or, you know, things that are that are those upgrades that people are doing now compared to what it was in the past. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, exactly. And as you said, it's, it's constant. If you've ever owned a home or lived in one, it's the work is never ending. It never <laughs> Just maintain it, it. It never <laughs> ever ends, and you think, "Why did I do this? Why did I have to have that house?" <laughs> exactly, you regret it once you're in it, hundred percent. <laughs> you are listening to Lion Tales on the Voice of Nassau Community College, ninety point three WHPC. My name is Dr. Linda Nady, and our guest today is Timothy Keogh, class of two thousand five. So we talked a little bit about this, but as a history professor, what are your what do you want the students to leave with once they complete your course? Um, I guess the you know there's two things, right? I always tell them one. Obviously, we are working on things like critical thinking, right? And we mean that I mean that very specifically, right? The idea of not just taking information at face value. I think that's more important now than ever, right? I mean, forget about even. Like 15 years ago, it was all oh, cable news. You got to pay attention to what they're telling you, right? Now with social media, I mean, the, the limited information they're getting from a 10 second TikTok, you know? Yeah. Um, and that kind of stuff. I mean, they're just being inundated with information all the time, and they're getting exposed to information more than any, probably any humans in the history of humanity. Right. Um, and so it's like you have to. Be critical of what you're, you know, being being exposed to at all times. You, you know, you can't just take it with that face value, and so that's why it's so important not just to kind of give them the content what caused the civil war, but instead understand the debates and therefore, you know, to understand that I need to actually like consider and judge the evidence being presented to me, yeah. and therefore come to my own conclusion about the cause of the civil war and not just blindly, you know, drink whatever the professor is telling me or the textbook is telling me. Yeah, have you ever, I mean, I, I guess we can probably say that we have seen division between the parties and di division when there's um, a, an election year and all of that, but has it ever been this sort of um, not done in a professional way? I mean, I know campaigns can become, you know, really, you know, down and dirty and controversial, but it seems like this is sort of off the rails completely. Like there's no real focus for either party or either candidate. It's just like, just seems like a mess. Um, what is your opinion about, you know, how we could maybe make it seem more legitimate or, or have a little bit more, um, I guess, I don't know, professionalism. Yeah. Well, you know, I always put this in perspective, right? The United States did once go to actual civil war. We actually did kill each other, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And it was much worse in the 1850s before the civil war started, uh, without a doubt, and crazier, and you know, with crackpots and people beating people in the house, in the floor of Congress and everything else, than what we have today. You know, it, it's as much as we talk about how how divided we are, it's hard to compare that to what was happening in the 1850s over the issue of slavery mm -hmm. and you know, states' rights and those things. Um, 
However, I agree with you in this sense, probably in your lifetime, indeed in my lifetime, right, it has been more divided than it was, let's just say, in 1992, yeah. <laughs> you know, or 1984, right. or 1980, um, in, in that way. And I think the, the bigger thing is kind of that tradition. Yeah, traditional, I guess, respectful, that's what the word I was yeah, looking for. Yeah, the decorum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and the decorum wasn't always there historically. In the 1850s, it was gone as well. No doubt about it, yeah. it was not there. Um, you know, as much as we like to talk about Lincoln, who, of course, was well-spoken, there were plenty of other politicians that were not <laughs> nearly yeah. as articulate, you know, on both sides. Um, um, but the reality here is, yeah, it's definitely lost at decorum. You know, and, uh, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, there's definitely a lack of real um, party leadership, meaning in the sense of, like, a, you know, the Democratic and Republican parties seem to be swept up by kind of personalities, yeah. you know, and there's not necessarily like a system to like, okay, we're going to elevate this candidate who we're going to put our forces behind. And this person has went through the ranks, you know, like a, you know, like a Ronald Reagan, who was a governor for years, for yeah. example, right. Or Bill Clinton, also a governor. And they kind of, you know, they identify this person as very competent and, and you know, and of course they went out of primary, but, you yeah. know, I think much more now it's kind of really focused on the individual um, in, in that way. And, and that's bad in two senses. Number one, you know, obviously, as you said, it can be poisonous to politics. We focus so much on their personality and what they say, you know, and some off the cuff remarks or yeah. Twitter. <laughs> yeah, because everything they yeah. say, it becomes sort of, you know, the comedy for the day or the joke for the day. But Exactly. And it becomes a focus. too. Yeah. Like, that's the problem, right? It's like, who cares what this person said on Twitter or what they misspoke? It's like, what are they passing? What are they pushing for legislation? That's what really matters. Yeah, <laughs> that's what really will then, matter, too. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, right, once they get into office, they don't necessarily have, you know, they haven't come through the ranks. So they have allies to get political things done, right? They're just kind of there as a personality. And, you know, it, it, their ability to kind of legislate or kind of, you know, do the kind of things like Lyndon Johnson did, you know, yeah. able to kind of, you know, work with senators to get civil rights and Voting Rights Act passed, for example, you know. We're not seeing that as much anymore. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting. To, I was reading a little bit about uh, President Johnson when he was, you know, he didn't want to become the president. He was like, oh, no. <laughs> it just, you know, what happened? It just fell upon him, and then he had to do it. So, um, but, you know, so what is your definition of leadership? I mean, I guess it was politically speaking, right? Uh, a leader, to me, and to be honest with you, would just be a figurehead, meaning uh, they, they, you know, they don't... The qualities matter less and, uh, as much as they are able to kind of represent the democratic will of, of people, um, if they're supposed to be elected officials. And you know, that, that means they have to make decisions, of course, but at the same time, they should also be pressured by both the electorate and feel that pressure, and they should also be pressured even by their party, assuming their party has like a platform that they're, they're fighting for. So they should kind of be representatives and therefore able to get what that party wants passed yeah. to actually get victory in that way, right? Because if we vote for that party based on what we want these things done, I don't know, taxes raised or lowered or whatever it may be, right? We should hope that the party will reflect what we want from it. Yes. And then the president or the leader will be able to kind of corral and, you know, understand the parliamentary elements of that of politics to get that stuff passed. Absolutely. I think that's what I would argue. Yeah, leadership should be. I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Timothy Keogh, class of 2005. How can our listeners contact you? Well, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty old-fashioned. The best way would be email, uh, T. Keogh, and that's T-K-E-O-G-H, at qcc.cuny.edu. That's qcc.cuny.edu. I answer emails all day. <laughs> Great. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Keogh. I would like to thank our guest. My name is Dr. Linda Nady, and I serve as a director on the board of the Nassau Community College Alumni Association, and I'm a proud alum. Lion Tales is available as a podcast on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. More information is online at nccradio.org. Thanks for listening to Lion Tales on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC.